you know, after being diagnosed this, I dove into this and researched a little bit. And I'm a little anxious to share with you guys because I think it's important to, you know, educate about this. So, um, you first assume someone is simply using drugs uh, when the symptoms present, but it's very different. Um, consider it, though, just as either like non-reversible damage to the brain or fatal. Um, it's, you can get it for simply being prescribed something that has an adverse reaction with your specific system. Uh, you can get it by mixing medications and even some, wow, specifies over-the-counter medications and even certain foods. This is why doctors question you and need to know everything. Um, you consume upon your general doctor's appointment or like if you're going to the ER, it makes a lot more sense now um, to try and avoid this from happening. If you are um, adding like a new medicine to ones you, you know, you're already taking or you evaluate uh, so that you um, are taking less risks, you know, and gaining uh, more knowledge, uh, I definitely agree with that. I think the key there is to notice uh, like your reaction, you know, how are you going to know or interaction, you know, hopefully it's evident. Um, but most people may say, well, isn't that obvious to know and do? Uh, looking over this research, though, you'd be surprised how much people withhold this information or fail to do any of these steps. Uh, I mean, it could be shame for what maybe they're taking or assuming they know better. It's just as real, though, and can be catastrophic, according to these numbers, as an overdose because it is too much of a drug or it could be a toxin like a, a mold exposure that you may have seen or known you know, about, but you didn't even realize the exposure is now affecting you, especially if you are still living in that you know, same environment. I think it goes the same. I'm not suggesting anyway that you, know, you become a regular in the hospital um, closest to you, but just... Um, you know, refusing to seek treatment when you discover these very real symptoms is disastrous and could, you know, very well end up, you know, tragic. So uh, many people since COVID diagnosed with mental disorders, I'm thinking about prescribed several medications even that I have seen in numbers that have since backfired uh, more times than not. It's already upsetting. If I were to get into the numbers with you, uh, that most of these people also could have done better with changing their diet, or exercising, and beginning, you know, vitamins and our supplements. Because a lot of the symptoms that are treated for mental turns out were actually, you know, deficiencies um, for mental uh, things like vitamin B, D, you know, or C. I'm not diagnosing or undiagnosing someone please understand uh you know it is what it is and it's not what it's not and it just depends on the person so just consider how certain um is the diagnosis is my point and what other things have you tried or not tried um as well um step over to this thought process how many people um are being diagnosed even with lung cancer that don't even smoke Unfortunately, it's as easy to face consequences as it um, is uncertainties. I've learned and only encouraged to have a diagnosis fit you. Don't make yourself fit a diagnosis. Know yourself well enough, you know, to work with what works for you and with you, right? Uh, one of my favorite comedians, even, for example, uh, she was so big on, you know, not drinking or not smoking, you know, only to now face advanced lung cancer. It's uh, Kathy Griffin. Uh, difficult, I'm sure, but thankfully, um, though, she did not begin drinking or smoking, you know, afterward. Uh, this makes me think back even to my grandfather after looking over all this because he was treated for cancer, but it turns out uh, he died quickly after, but he worked long hours with heavy metals at a plant for many years even, so that surely could have played a part in his life and death too. 
but I don't even know if this info was considered back like, you know, 18 years ago. Anyway, um, the term neurotoxicity refers to damage to the brain or peripheral uh, nervous system caused by exposure to natural or man-made uh, toxic substances. These toxins uh, can alter the activity of the nervous system um, in ways that can disrupt or kill nerves. Nerves are essential for transmitting and processing information in the brain, as well as other areas of the nervous system. Due to their high me metabolic rate, neurons are the greatest risk of damage uh, caused by neurotoxins. Uh, this is followed in order of risk by oligodendrocrites, I think it's called, and astrocrites, microgilia, and capillary, endothelium cells, it's all parts of the brain, um, to know the lingo. Depending on a neurotoxicity uh, chemical profile, it will cause damage to certain parts of uh, particular cellular elements of the nervous system. You know, non-polar substances are more soluble in lipids and can therefore access the nerves and the tissue more easily um, than polar combo pounds. It makes me think the best way to describe it is like throwing water, you know, onto like a laptop. Because um, our brain is our main computer, right? So um, it makes it less soluble in the lipids, you know, to absorb the new information that we need. The body's response to uh, neurotoxicity is influenced by factors such as the neurotransmitter uh, affected, uh, cellular membrane um, integrity, and the presence of these detoxifying mechanisms. Some examples of substances that can be neurotoxic to humans include chemotherapy drugs that are used to kill fast-growing cells, um, radiation, drug therapies, or drugs of abuse, heavy metals such as mercury and lead, uh, certain foods and food additives, insecticides, pesticides, cosmetics, industrial and cleaning solvents. Some examples of neurotoxic substances our environment has become polluted with, and that is difficult for people to avoid exposure to include. Uh, things like mercury, um, cadmium, lead, insecticides, solvents, car exhaust, you know, even chlorine. Um, formaldehyde, formaldehyde, it's pronounced, uh, we've heard of fentanyl and phenol. Some of the effects of neurotoxicity may appear immediately, while others can take months or years to manifest. The effects of neurotoxicity depends on various different factors, such as the characteristics of the neurotoxicity, the dose a person has been exposed to, uh, the ability to metabolize and excrete the toxin, uh, the ability of affected mechanism and structures to recover and how vulnerable a cellular target is, you know, i.e. the person. Some of these symptoms of neurotoxicity include paralysis or weakness in the limbs, altered sensations, uh, tingling and numbness in the limbs, headache, vision loss, loss of memory and cognitive um, function, uncontrollable, obsessive, and or compulsive behaviors, uh, behavioral problems, sev uh, oh, sexual dysfunction, uh, depression, loss of circulation, imbalance, flu-like symptoms, other conditions that may develop as a result of neurotoxicity include chronic fatigue syndrome, attention deficit, hyperactive disorder, uh, chronic sinusitis, and asthma. Uh, that does not respond to therapies. Makes me think of that chronic runny nose. Sometimes, or symptoms, excuse me, may also resemble those seen in some autoimmune conditions. So if the problem, person's already, uh, immune system is affected poorly, then this is going to be much harder on their system, of course. So like irritable bowel syndrome, uh, Romeo arthritis, some examples of toxins that occur naturally in the brain and can lead to neurotoxicity include um, oxygen radicals, beta aniloid and glutamate, you know, aside from causing movement disorders, cognitive uh, deterioration even, and dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. 
neurological toxicity has also been shown to be a major contributor to progressive neurological disorders, such as Alzheimer's disease. Diagnosis. The best test to show whether the peripheral nervous system has been affected is the nerve conduction test. Tests used to detect damage to the brain include uh, pulpography, computerized balance heart rate, uh, variable uh, brain imaging with the triple camera, it's a SPECT, I think it's S-P-E-C-T, system and uh, nerve uh, psychological testing. Uh, the treatment approach is neurological, that neurological toxicity, uh, elimination obviously, or um, uh, reduction of the toxic substance, you know, once found in therapy to relieve symptoms or provide support. Uh, treatment may also involve avoiding uh, certain, the contaminated air or the food or, you know, water pollutants. Some examples of therapies used in treatment of neurotoxicity include uh, massage, exercise, and immune uh, modulation. So the prognosis for this, the outcome of neurotoxicity, depends on the duration and extent of exposure to the toxic substance, uh, as well as the degree of the neural damage you know, to the brain. Exposure to neurotoxins can be fatal in some cases, uh, while in others, patients survive, but may not completely recover. Um, in other cases, patients do completely recover after receiving treatment. Um, current uh, research scientists are looking at whether occupational and environmental toxins may play a role in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, and multiple sclerosis. Makes me think even more about grandpa. Another popular research topic in this area is the mechanisms behind neuro, uh, oh, immune responses, yes. Uh, you know, age, your health already, that occur in the nervous system. Whether or not the interaction between environmental factors and uh, genes contributes uh, to brain disorders in children and adults uh, is another research question that is currently being investigated. So I will keep even looking to this myself because it's profound what I'm learning from it. So I hope it was helpful for you guys, okay? Have a great day. Talk to you guys soon, okay? Bye.